Hello everyone, welcome to a broadcast. We are live and we are continuing our series on multi-site church that we've been doing this year. Uh, each month we take a different aspect of what it is to lead multi-site and we just bounce it around, have a conversation about it with some uh, guests and then uh, there's the opportunity for you to ask whatever questions you've got as well. So uh, you're here on Zoom, just type them in or on Facebook as well. Feel free to ask your questions there and we'll put them to our panel. We've got um, Phil Varley from King's Church in London and Tim Simmons from Christ Church Manchester with me. So give us a wave, Phil. <laughs> and Tim, not claiming to be Phil, there we go. Um, good to have you both with us uh, today. So, um, yeah, the, the first thing um, I, I want to ask you, because we're going to talk about operations and management and what it is uh, behind the scenes to, to run. I, I kind of think of it like... Um, like a skeleton in a body so if it's if it's not there if we don't have good systems of operation uh, i've been in organizations like that and it seems like nothing can move nothing can happen nothing can get done but then i've been in other organizations where it's just way too prominent and uh, bureaucratic and when the skeleton dominates it's not healthy either we want people to thrive and so we'll have a conversation about systems but, but it's really a conversation about people about getting the best out of people and helping them uh, to, to use their gifts as part of the body of Christ and then um, we're going to start just by setting a bit of context so we're going to find out uh, in Phil's church and in Tim's church how things work so I'll ask you both just tell us a bit about your church um, the, the journey to multi-site you've been on, what, what style or kind of multi-site church you are. And then just for, for a bit of fun as well, because um, I know both of you are in a setting where there's a, a senior leader uh, as well who has a lot of um, vision and sway and then doing the operations and management means taking vision and making it reality. Talk to us a little bit about the, the senior leader as well and your, your relationship with them professionally or personally if you want to and what it's like working with them so um, Phil do you want to kick us off and tell us about that at Kings? <clears throat> okay so a bit of the journey first so uh, we've been a multi-site church since 2011 um, <clears throat> I think it was mainly stimulated by we bought a building we kind of run out of space at our Catford site we bought a building I think originally we wondered about whether we would all move to this building and I, then I think on that journey or in that process we worked out Actually, I think maybe this is just a different model. We were going to stay at Catford and launch another site. At the same time, a church near us, Downham, had joined us. And we thought, actually, we're going to launch a site back out into the Downham building. So I wouldn't say we stumbled into it. It was slightly more thought through than that. But it, it wasn't something we planned for years and years. And so we started in 2011. We went from one, if you like, site, regular church, to suddenly three sites. Um, the first three years of being multi-site were really hard I would say I think to everybody attending it all looked very normal but on the inside it felt like we were chasing our tails everywhere and trying to kind of work out uh, Jim Tomblin who's a multi-site expert in the state says it's like building a plane while you're flying it and that is exactly what it felt like to us and it took about three or four years to work it out and um, so now we have four sites um, Oh, we did have four sites. I think they still exist, but obviously we're all meeting online right now. So we have four sites. So we launched another one a kind of year and a half ago in Beckenham. Um, they are all very different sizes and different seasons, uh, but all in a good place. Is that a, does that answer your question, Tom, or do you want a bit more? No, that's great. That's that's good. Yeah, and um, then uh, tell us a bit about um, particularly your role with the um, management yeah. and ops and how that dovetails with Steve's role as well. Yeah, so Steve and I, I've worked, Steve and I have worked together over 20 years. And so there's lots of history, which I suspect is like Tim, I don't know, but I, certainly that's my scenario. So in fact, I actually live, I lived with Steve and Deb for, I don't know, almost a year before I went and got married. So I know them really well, and that obviously really helps. And he kind of brought me through uh, when he first came to lead the church in Catford. And I've done pretty much every job there is in the church or overseen most of the roles in the church. So that helps as well. My job currently is I'm like the number two guy and directly I'm responsible for all the sites. And we, we kind of think of the church on two sides. It's obviously not quite as clean cut as this, but we think operationally in terms of finance, facilities, logistics. And we think pastorally in terms of sites, ministries, kids, youth, worship, all those different ministries. And 
particularly the pastoral side is my direct responsibility plus all the sites. So that's kind of how we divide it up. And yeah, Steve and I, I, I think it's like every, I think it's like everything. On a good day, we work really well together. I think there's inherent tension in any kind of working relationship like that because that, that is just the way it is. And it's all about managing that and bringing the best out of it. So I think we have enough history that we manage it pretty well, but we do see the world a bit differently, which is probably why it works quite well. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Tim, do you want to uh, share a bit about Christchurch and about um, yeah, yourself and Colin and how things work? Yep, so uh, history of uh, Christchurch is that it was um, a small uh, congregation of about 15 people on the east side of Manchester in a, a town called Hyde, which is a kind of an ex mill town outside the motorway circle of Manchester. Um, and then Colin and Mary and a few other couples uh, went and joined that church, I think after coming back from America when Colin was there. This is about 13 years ago now, I think maybe. I joined that church and uh, it was a house church effectively. And it moved out of the house church into a town hall in Hyde and then grew quite, actually quite quickly from 15 to I think about 40 or 50 or so um, there, gathered a bit of a crowd. And then um, they were praying just because Colin's background is uh, in, in our kind of group of churches in, in New Frontiers, uh, we, he would, um, be described as um, apostolic I suppose so a lot of church planting had been on the main team to run New Frontiers um, as it was um, for a number of years working with uh, Terry Virgo, David Divnish. So he had a, a kind of long history of church planting and church planting in Manchester and so um, the church was a little bit had that in their head anyway and so they were praying to plant into South Manchester where all the students were um, and their prayers got me and Vicky moved to, to Manchester for let's just say for better not worse absolutely for better um, and so we moved up over 10 years nearly 11 years ago and um, started another meeting of CCM in on an evening meeting in Fallowfield a student area and we moved quite near to that and not and at the time there was one other maybe two other families that lived around there at that time and that was it and so I guess we got into multi-site by planting and then realizing that we were a multi-site by two, two meetings and that um, Colin's desire always was that we would hold it together and, and it wouldn't become separate churches. Um, and I, don't, I hadn't really thought about it that hard. I was just amazed that anybody would turn up to a church plant. So, um, and so then it evolved from there to three, three meetings, then four, then five, now six. Um, in five different places um, and I think we we realized actually relatively early on that we were going to be multi-site and we were going to hold it together that way and um, so yeah that would be a, about the history of it so now it's I don't know it's hard to know how big it is now because of the the new era that we're in I would suggest with the fringe uh, there are probably 320 to 350 adults that with kind of uh, fringe I, I would say um which uh yeah and i goodness knows how many kids there are so um yeah and so colin is the 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 leads the church and uh, so the joke we have is colin leads the church everybody knows that colin is the church leader but i run the church effectively so um so i would be the i don't know second in command um but work very closely with tom and another guy called andy um and colin and so the four of us are a little bit of the the core team at least operationally that kind of make um the activity of the church happen and that's where the next site plant will come out from and um so um i would think listening to how you described your job descriptions phil ours go through phases of being as clear as that <laughs> and phases of being less clear um so yeah and you're right in so with colin there um because he same as you he but i was a nobody who came and planted a church um to see whether i could um and so he coached and brought me through and uh, taught and trained and um, was very patient uh, with me over years he would argue that he's still patient with me i would suggest <laughs> it's now the other way around <laughs> yeah okay um, yeah long conversations about whether you can change a zoom background are not in my <laughs> job description so um yeah but that that would be how it would be and if there is an inherent tension in it and when it's working well i think it's yeah it's it's actually very easy um and 
when one of us is under pressure um, for whatever reason, then it can be, yeah, then you just have to work it out kind of day by day, don't you? But Yeah. yeah. I, I actually think the tension in, a, in that kind of relationship, actually, it can sound negative, but actually it's potentially very positive because it's a bit like, it's a bit like really great creative people, you know, great bands have some tension with they're going to create great music. And I think it's just the product of slightly different gifts, which when you harness them, you know, in any team, there's going to be some of that if you get to know each other well enough, right? Yeah. You know, it's just about managing is it yeah. and doing the process right, I think, in terms of decision making, people being heard, even if, even if we don't all agree, that's key, I think. Um, so I think the tension can be a really, you know, it, it's inevitable. And I think it's actually potentially positive. Mm. I think it's a bit unique to multi-site in that when you do multi-site, you create lots of spheres and areas of work and influence where no one person can be in them. Um, and so there are areas of the church which have been molded and invented and molded by me that Colin actually doesn't have much influence in. And there are also areas which is exactly the same for me. And so you, you, have, to, you have to hold things quite lightly um a lot of the time and even the things that are yours you, you actually have to realize that actually multi-site often is very collaborative and can involve um losing influence and then gaining influence it kind of depending on the season you're in um so yeah it's uh, it's definitely good for the soul <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that's a part of it um that i've noticed like for for myself and for you as well tim like part of why we joined is that there was space given to to have a go and try some ideas and uh, and make things happen that in a in a thing that was held on more tightly from Colin or whoever just wouldn't have had that opportunity and made it a very attractive thing um, yeah yeah uh, it was interesting to hear uh, just how different the journeys to multi-site were um i think that um affects the conversation a bit like uh, at King's going from something really quite big already uh, into a multi-site model and uh, having to re-engineer uh, everything from from one set of um, uh, systems and operations to, to something that works very differently um, uh, compared to Christchurch kind of building it from the ground up really and inventing it uh, on, on the fly as, uh, as things were started site by site and realizing that systems that work for for two sites like one in the morning one in the evening uh, suddenly break when you add a third one in and um uh, and that um phil you were saying about um for two or three years early on um it, it was a struggle and um mm, kind of yeah. how it works what, what were some of the pressures and areas that that struggle was expressed well i think i mean i think the the bottom line of it was we were not that clear we were clear on some things but there was a bunch of areas where it was all a bit vague and i think you tend you typically get problems where it's just not clear who's responsible for what um i think it's like tim says you, you do lose the, you know there's lots of gains in most stuff you do lose things and people used to be very clear this is my job i'm responsible for all of this now suddenly there's somebody else you know you're the kids person now suddenly there's somebody else doing kids over here and is that first person now responsible for their kids work or are they responsible for it and how much do they come under your leadership and there's all those kind of dynamics and wins and losses. And um, so some of it was literally structural. You know, we just hadn't got clarity on the exact structure we wanted to work and had spent enough time. We, we did well on some things, but there were definitely some areas where we were a bit vague, which just leaves you to that kind of slightly awkward conversation around who's, who's allowed to make the decision here, who's responsible here, and how much does this site have to do it like the other site? <laughs> you know, where is the space to try new things and where is the space to be, you know, this is, this is how we all do it and it's non-negotiable. And I, it took us a while to kind of clarify that. And, and I would say those were, that's the kind of main thing. So um, we're much clearer now on what we would call constants. This is what we want everywhere. And therefore outside of that, what we're happy for people to do differently. And I actually think, you know, different multi-sites will, obviously do this differently some are very permissive and effectively are just a kind of association you know with some kind of you know some things that hold them together and others are far more tight that everything is exactly the same everywhere i'm kind of a bit more in the middle um i actually think having some difference is one of the attractions about it some of our people would prefer prefer this site to the other one and that's why they go there um but i think just working that out was a big it just takes a long time 
and it takes lots of conversations because it's not just a structural conversation it's a conversation like you said it's about people and it's about what they feel called to do it's about their job descriptions and their roles and it's about them losing some influence and it's quite challenging so it took us quite a while to work it out but that was, those were the main things it's about who's responsible for what and who has the lead in what area mm-hmm. yeah very good mm-hmm. yeah um tim so it's a similar question i guess for for christchurch and like what what have been some of the the hardest bits or kind of pressure points along the way of trying to figure out how to get the whole thing working on a multi-site level i think um uh yeah it's the, yeah i mean phil just mentioned it what what goes local what um you know what a site pastor is just allowed to decide to do um and i th- permissive is a good word i think on one level actually we're quite permissive so we give away like preaching program is run through the sites community groups run through the sites kids work is run in the site so a lot of the of those things are run there and we, we talk about constants is a good word we talk about kind of cultures that we want to have and them to exist in each site and often that's more kind of pastoral leadership style um which i think that's probably the hill that we would we would choose to die on um more than more than the kind of more structural things Mm. most likely so working those things out because that that's very much then that often the personality and the sense of calling that the site leader have themselves so even in how a site leader would describe discipleship um actually when so someone would say your oh, discipleship is really important to me and nobody's going to disagree with that but when you actually whittle down what they actually mean um and kind of practically then then actually there are some pretty big differences and so discipleship for for um for me for example is lots of people in my house as often as i can and it's very social and community and um a, kind of fun and then you build relationships over years and then the conversations that you want to have just come out naturally for others it's much more in with intense conversation in a coffee shop one-to-one um and so kind of realizing the differences and neither is right or wrong actually both have um clear strengths and weaknesses um but actually someone saying i really believe in discipleship you don't um which has happened a few times or or me saying oh, you you know i'm really social you're you're just mean to people <laughs> and so working those things out actually was a, a really um yeah that that's where the big tensions would come in uh, more than anything else actually because so you'd think okay we money might be a tension well actually it was quite easy to rally people behind giving and um vision for money and giving away to the poor those things are quite simple so yeah does that answer the question tom uh, i think it does yeah and i think um i mean you mentioned the culture thing i think the um like one of the culture points we talk about is think the best uh, and i think when you work through these things to to live that out really helps like yeah. say the discipleship thing if um if my instinct is to do things differently to say tim's instinct if I'm thinking the best of Tim and seeing no, Tim's got the same heart behind it and um, he's using his gifts in this and, uh, and assuming that he's, he's about the same thing, not just trying to um, do something completely different. And then if he's seeing me the same way, it means we can have the conversation easily. It takes the suspicion away and it's been very, yeah, very helpful, I've found. Um, yeah, Tom, can I ask, Tom, can I ask a question of Tim just, in, just to find out whether they've had a similar challenge to us on an, another tension? Please do, yeah, yeah absolutely. Do, do, you, do you have, I mean, th- this is not something that is spoken about overtly, and actually we're in a pretty good place on this, but I remember, particularly in the early days, there could be a sense of if one site was doing really, really well and another site was struggling, it was very hard for the site that was struggling not to feel a bit envious, a bit second rate, a bit just the comparison thing almost like amongst siblings Mm. and i don't think we managed that very well at the start i think we are much better at managing it now um i talk about it a lot more with our site leaders Mm. to try and just draw it out and to get rid of it but i we just didn't really talk about it at the start but it was definitely there people felt you know that they were doing really well or they were not there was a comparison thing going on and have you experienced any of that and how have you handled that i think we probably do actually um, I think, again, our, our model is a bit different. So every site, most site leaders start by planting. Um, and so then you're comparing uh, sometimes 10 of you to 
the established site with 50 or 60. Uh, our, our biggest site, our biggest meeting that we would have would be uh, in Lady Barn, which is, would top out at 60 or 70. Um, and then one of the other sites is two meetings, which if you added it all together is over 100. But um, uh, so, it, but because most of our site leaders have planted, they've all been through that journey of really not having many people and then it yeah. growing to more. Um, and which kind of it does inoculate a little bit. Um, and I think we've realized over the years um, that we, when people are generous with their own people, so allowing people to leave um, to get sites started, then it becomes quite easy. Um, it, yeah, so I mean, I've been in a position where I was leading one of the sites and a site plant was going on and it seemed like I was losing my best people every couple of weeks to go and start this new one. And so I was in the stronger position actually numerically and things going well. Um, but I was still seeing people being taken and put somewhere else because that's where the energy needed to be actually. Um, so I think we've definitely seen that. Um, I don't know if it was more, I don't, I don't know if we're better at it now. I think we've realized that actually the more you include site leaders in the middle with each other, um, part of kind of big decisions and uh, the the kind of the, the overall vision of where we're all going together um, the easier it is when somebody feels like they're not part of that they usually either relax by uh, react by tapping out entirely and not caring or by being quite antagonistic that they're not involved and both are bad um, so yeah so I, it, there is definitely an element of that in there which so getting people together often uh, definitely helps us yeah. Yeah. We would say very similar. I think getting people together and helping them feel part of the, the one church thing as well as their own site. Yeah. So I think things silo so fast is what we've experienced. You know, I, I can do it as well. I just get into my thing, want to do my thing. Mm. And I think keeping people thinking across the whole has been really important for us. So that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, kind of tap into that a bit more then. Cause you were saying about getting the right people in the conversation how do you decide like who who to invite into into what room like who gets to be a part of the decision making process who gets to be um just part of a conversation uh with, without every room being full of way too many people to be practical like how, how do you make those calls phil well, that's, that's, yeah. that's a very good question um i don't know we well we change our meeting structure a lot so I'm not, I suspect what happens is we get it wrong a lot and then we keep adapting, but we do keep adapting probably for those very reasons. And I think you want small teams to make decisions and you want larger gatherings for ownership and also consultation and kind of testing those decisions. So certainly the larger we've got, often the smaller the decision-making team needs to become. We've learned that. If you try and do it with big teams, it just, everything slows down and you just cap everything that's going forward. and You, you will damage the momentum I think you've got. But I do think if you try and do everything small, you will lose that sense of ownership, particularly in a multi-site thing where mm. people, it's so, there's such an inherent possibility for people to feel disempowered or that they just want to do their own thing, that it's really important. And so we probably just do a blend. We do a blend of smaller senior leadership team, which is quite a small team making quite a lot of senior decisions, but we blend that with lots of other conversations with the whole staff. We get all our staff together at different times. We do lots of social stuff with all our staff together to try in terms of just team morale as well as training. So it, to us, it's a real blend. And I think it's something that keeps, you know, it's just an evolution really and no meeting structure should stay the same because you're yeah. cheap, you basically should change as the church changes and as you realize it doesn't work anymore so yeah. it's probably not a very good answer but <laughs> that's kind of how it's worked trial and error basically yeah i mean i was thinking in anticipation of this call was think i was just kind of thinking back over the way we run things and i've realized that actually we probably change how we do our kind of operational Kind of staff and kind of senior volunteer kind of meetings yearly actually yeah. and it's a bit dependent on the different characters that are around uh, and who needs to be involved uh, in order to get them on side and to be good for us as well um so and um, yeah we usually by the time we get to the beginning of the summer 
the meeting system we had is beginning to not work as well as it had done in September. I mean, it really, because the church has grown a bit, some new opportunities have arisen, new leaders have come through and you need to change it. And I remember the first, with the first couple of cycles of that, I really thought, oh gosh, we must be rubbish at this. We can't, we can't find something that works. Uh, why do we have to keep changing it? Surely it would be so good. Everybody can just come and fit into it perfectly. Um, but then you realize actually you just, you have to, it has to be constant evolution um, and um, acknowledge that what was once a good idea is now not such a good idea anymore. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been, I don't know what it's been like for you guys the last sort of four or five weeks, but I, it's, it's, it's been like church on speed here in terms of the amount of decisions you're making and decisions that you would have taken three months over, you're taking kind of 30 minutes over. And, and we've changed, even over the last four or five weeks, we've changed our meeting structure every week in light of what we're going through and it's just it's like a little picture of i think what happens needs to happen generally you have to keep evaluating and, and not hold on to one structure all the time because it yeah i agree it does change yeah very good yeah so so from that and the the last few weeks obviously um have been pretty unique in terms of church life but um what what things from thinking about your systems for for moving online and doing church in lockdown and that are the lessons you've learned from this process that even moving forward when we come out of this you'd want to um, adapt how you're doing things and, and apply oh i mean i think yeah i mean obviously it's a it's a it's a in one sense it's a terrible season isn't it in many ways and lots of really awful things happening and tragic loss and that will continue but at the same time there's it's it's a very kind of inventive kind of creative season which is really interesting and it's definitely pushed us into doing things that we've talked about and not got to um and i think it's made us make decisions fast at times so i, I just think i mean obvious things like the use of technology we're just using zoom a lot more and things like that and i'm sure we will continue doing that but i mean even i mean this is probably a very silly example but um I'm involved in the worship team across our church and for years we've kind of got our songs out in the life of the church and but it's been quite slow and ponderous as a process and that's you know partly my fault and we just decided we're just going to get songs out every week and people are going to record them on their phone we're going to post them on our website and we're going to get them out along with other creative stuff that's coming out in terms of on Wednesday we do it every Wednesday and it was just like all the inertia went and we just said that's going to be good enough it doesn't have to be perfect let's just get it out and it it's those kind of things I think are amazingly refreshing and mm. and I think the other thing for probably one of the other things for us is I think in a you know in a, in a sizable church one of the things you can do when you're in leadership it feels you spend a lot of time running the organization mm. and you can feel quite a long way away at times from being with people and I think this season has allowed us to and forced us to in a really good way connect with lots of people personally phoning lots of people talking to lots of people and so it's strange isn't it you're not in the room with everybody but you're connecting with a lot more people and i just think that is so good um i'm not sure we're gonna be able to keep doing that when everything opens up again one day but i think the the inventive thing i really like i think it's forced us to think differently and given us space to go how can we do it differently let's just try it and just try it and so i like that a lot yeah. so it's more of a conceptual way of thinking rather than necessarily lots of actual yeah. You know things we're going to do differently yeah. but an approach yeah very good do you find things similar tim or any yeah i think so um i think uh yeah so it's funny i think some some of the things that we do when we when things open up again will will not be done online and we'll be desperate to get them off on offline and into the be in the same room yeah. but some other things we're going to hold on to um <clears throat> that were you realize actually there are a legacy of once being a smaller church and having uh, gotten bigger, we've just never, never pulled the trigger and made the change. Whereas this has just forced us to. Um, and I think the actually online Sunday meetings is something we've talked about on and off for a number of years and never quite been brave enough to try. Um, and, and I think now there'll be a proper, we'll, we'll really have to think actually, should we carry on um, doing something online? Um, Kind of as a even as a weekly thing having an online site um i think it, or, or how that could work and whether we are, i think the now we've been through this phase i think like the 
it has opened up the door for creative possibilities. Um, I mean, even, you know, just thinking, well, is that something we could use as a church planting facility for planting churches in, in other places that aren't Manchester and even in other countries. So, so that I think it's opened up a lot of those doors. So I think something like this usually makes you better at what you're already quite good at, doesn't it? And as well as then slightly exposing some of your weaknesses as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I think lots of churches are going to have some kind of online expression now, aren't they? I know that can look like lots of different things, but I think, I mean, we've just, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? You feel when you look back, you think, how could we, why did we not, how did we miss that? But yeah. we've just had people, I mean, obviously we've got people who, you know, live miles away coming, but also we've got people who are, would be coming to our church if it wasn't for illness or something else who are like, suddenly, finally they feel connected because they haven't been able to come to church for months. And you realize, wow, it's just, it's, I know it's lots of question marks about online church, but that it's such a potent kind of tool as well, mm -hmm. I think. We've got so many people signing up for Alpha. I mean, that's extraordinary in terms of online. You just get guests all the time who are not people who are not, you know, haven't got faith. Maybe would not feel brave enough or want to walk get physically into your building yet, but are happy because it's pretty anonymous and very safe to sit in their living room and watch the service and sign up for an Alpha course. And there are lots of opportunities. So I, I, yeah, I think the online th this season is forcing us to do some stuff and I think some of it will stay with us to some degree um, going forward. Yeah. Cool. I'm um, going to take it into a different area for a bit. Um, we're talking about managing a church. Um, like one of the areas I thought it'd be good to just dig into a bit is metrics. Um, uh, and what, what is it that you actually measure? Because it's, it's often said that the things you measure uh, are the things that end up getting changed and improved. Um, just talk, talk us through in both of your contexts. What things do you actually keep an eye on week by week, month by month? Uh, why do you choose those things as the things to measure? And then what do you do with the information? Um, yeah, e either of you feel free to start. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start because Phil started everything. Go on, Tim. <laughs> so we, and actually, Tom, you can chip in because you'll remember the things that we measure. So uh, we measure from a Sunday, we'll measure the number of people there and kids at, and in different age groups. We measure the number of new people that turn up on a Sunday, like first time visitors. Um, then um, some of the sites will measure how all of those individuals are followed up. In fact, I think all of them do actually. Um, we'll, yeah, we'll measure that. <clears throat> and then on more knucklehead basis, you know, we measure finances pretty diligently, online presence mm -hmm. as well. Um, we measure, sometimes this is more anecdotal, but we'll measure community group involvement. And actually in this season, we're measuring that a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, have I missed anything, Tom? Um, I, I mean, no, you, with, with the online stuff, you've covered like a, a lot of the social media stuff, yeah. a lot of the sermon lessons and those kind of things. Yeah, but... hits on the website, even where they're looking on the website, we'll, we'll look quite carefully at that. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, w with all those numbers then, um, if you see something in the numbers that um, surprises you, that looks down or causes alarm, like how often, how often would you be checking this and, and noticing stuff and kind of what would kick into play if, if some of the numbers were concerning? Well, all of those numbers I said, I think I check them all weekly. So I, I like to have my head on all of them weekly as much as you can. Um, and it de depends what they are, really. So the, the, the new people on Sunday, actually, I think in one of the sites that I ran, we went through a phase of just hardly getting anybody new at all on a Sunday. Um, and, you, and that just spoke to a, uh, an issue within the site of, uh, it just not growing very much. It's glaringly obvious. It just it, it was static for maybe two years, maybe even a bit longer than that. Uh, and so that spoke of a number of issues that needed to resolve around um, kind of what I was doing as a leader and where the congregation was at itself as to kind of the demographic of the group. Actually, they were all very busy people with a lot of young families. So invitational capacity, shall we say, is, was not huge there. Um, so realise then actually we needed, um, so my preference always for, for churches growing and bringing in new people and unbelievers was that people would bring their friends. It's always been my 
what I would prefer to happen and to work towards and realize in this particular site, we needed an initiative that would gather people from outside who weren't, we didn't know kind of almost cold contact. Um, and so started doing family fun days and things like that. So, so I, I, that can be pretty informative. Um, yeah. Does, is that what you mean, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah that, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, what about for you guys? Is it similar things that you'd mentioned? Yeah. yeah. Very, very, very similar. Um, probably some other things as well. I mean, my issue with metrics sometimes is <clears throat> I'm sure there's been scenarios where we've produced so many reports, but no one's got the time to even look at them. Mm. So I'm impressed that Tim is on this every week. Because <laughs> I've got nothing Steve, better to do, Steve Phil. Is, yeah, yeah well, obviously there's some other questions. I think, Tom, you should ask him in a moment um, about his job description. But um, yeah, we we very similar measurements. And Steve, obviously, who I work with is, you know, he he's big into data. That's one of the ways that he, we, we, we tend to make decisions in a slightly different way. He's very, you know, uh, interested in and informed by data. I'm interested in it, but he's probably even more, um, big, you know, we, we would monitor numbers closely on Sundays. Um, I think you learn a lot from that. Obviously, uh, what we have, we call a lights no more form. That's a kind of new people form. We would monitor that, but you know, baptisms, first time commitments, you know, because what we find is all our sites have different strengths. Some of them have got loads of new people coming. When well, we found this recently, that one of our sites had a lot of new people coming, but actually they weren't growing. And it was like, there's some kind of disconnect here. And that, that metric really helped inform that because you can kind of sense it, but suddenly you had something concrete telling you, you know, that this is the case. They're getting just as many new people as that other site, but they're not growing at the same rate. And they don't seem to be losing people, so what's going on? And that led us to look at the building. It led us to change the whole way the chairs are laid out. It led us to have a conversation about the demographic of the site and that maybe because of the makeup of the site, people didn't necessarily come so frequently, but were still committed. And it, But it all sprung from looking at the numbers, which mm -hmm. so num I think the problem can come when people talk about numbers as if they're the thing and the numbers are the thing, but numbers are a very helpful gauge to the thing, which is people. Um, so yeah, but we, we, it sounds like we measure some very similar things. I think one of the things we learned years ago, particularly on numbers was just measuring the numbers against the capacity of the building you're in, which I know seems weird right now because none of us are in buildings, but yeah. we learned a lot about just when the building is full and when the car park is full and when the kids rooms are full, all those times are issues. Mm. And whilst we might love it because the building looks packed, mm. there's this counterintuitive going on where the new person walks and goes, there's not space for me. Oh, yeah. my, it just looked like chaos in the zero to fours. I don't want to leave my, my child there. And whilst we're all happy because we know everybody, they're like, I'm going to try somewhere else. Or mm -hmm. they don't say it. <laughs> yeah. Not normally anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think those things have really helped us actually make space and think about launching a site or think about launching another meeting. Yeah, I think that's especially true in multi-site. Um, you're not always there and you don't see with your eyes the, the kids room is full um you need the numbers to tell you or oh, it's a lot harder to find out um yeah another thing that um would be good to talk about is just communication um uh, which again to make things work across sites where um the central team whoever that ends up being isn't always in the room with everyone um communication is pretty key um how do you do it uh, particularly in terms of people speaking on behalf of your church um, people have different voices sometimes different things are expressed through that how do you train people in speaking the ccm way or the king's way and representing you well in how they do it who gets to share with people on behalf of you um, so you, tom you're talking primarily about kind of communicating externally is in not within your team but like in terms of on a sunday morning or to the church generally yeah, I'd, I'd say things like um who gets to write and send a text message from the church yeah. account branded as coming from the church who gets to post on your social media um with this being a, a kind of a, an official communication from you as a church yeah it's well, a really good question it's exactly the right that's exactly the right question to ask. I think we um, we we treat that all pretty carefully. So we're not we we don't, it's not a free fall at all. We would try and I mean this is one of the things about this new season is is it's forced us to relook at 
that whole thing and make use of social media a lot better than we were before and things like that. But we would, we're fortunate in that we have, we basically have a team on our staff. Um, I think what Tim was talking about earlier about culture is really important in the communications thing about people of understanding and agreeing this is our approach on evangelism or whatever it is. So they know if they do stand up, they are speaking out of a place of embodying the culture because sometimes it's the message but it's the tone of the message which is key you know you can say the same message same word for word but something about the tone one person sounds like it's an invite and the other person tells what sounds like it's, you're telling them to do something and we would have a big thing about that we invite people for example we invite people to worship we don't tell them to worship you wrote it out on a piece of paper it would look very similar but how you deliver it um, can be very different so i think understanding culture and being clear on culture is really important and then we, we, we are clear in terms of, you know, the senior leader or the leaders would only communicate on certain issues, big financial asks, you know, but there are other issues where we're happy for the site guys to communicate. And we have a kind of split between central messaging and site messaging, where there's a kind of a bit of a, you know, we, we kind of primarily central messaging on a Sunday. Some of the site leaders will deliver that, but big messages we might do by video, like really key ones. Tim, how about for you? What's, what's it like for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, me and Tom um, have kind of kind of talked this through numbers of times over the years. Um, and I think Tom and I particularly, but Colin as well, I think actually are quite sensitive to the what the CCM voice is. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Tom's absolutely right. There's, there are some situations where, so we try for quite um, informal, like our online uh, emails, um, text messages, relatively informal. Uh, releasing uh, light and breezy kind of communication kind of wording and style um, and so we're very sensitive to anything that is it's, it's not too instructional because we like to be very clear and so people aren't wasting their time reading stuff but anything that's a little bit stern or slightly school teachery uh, and sometimes it's imperceptible so uh, the three of us will be looking at something and go it's just not right is it it's just a bit stern and somebody else comes and looks at it and like, what are you talking about? But we, there is a, there's a certain vibe that we, we know that we want. Um, I think on Sundays, we're still a little bit hit and miss on it. Um, we've realized generally in anything, if there is a, like, um, a project. So we ran a week of prayer. Oh, but it seems like a million years ago. I think it was only <laughs> January. Um, and, <laughs> it does feel um, like a long time ago. Does, it? It? And it was Colin's idea and he just hammered it through and he was the owner and and it was a success it worked really well it was a great week of prayer and colin was the owner of it and there was a weekend away we did last year the first one we've ever done and that was my thing and i hammered it through and so we've realized we need one person to really own a new initiative and we've realized actually when other people are communicating on sundays they can get all of the facts right and but just the it just doesn't work mm. um and so and I think our multi-site model, where we don't have a lot of Sunday video, for example, um, back in the real world, um, I, does make that harder to do. And I don't think we, I don't think we've ever quite nailed it. So we now often say, look, this is really, this is a site leader job. The site leader needs you can't just give this to the anchor person. It has to be the yeah. site leader. And then we're on the phone to the site leader saying, look, this is why you need to get this right. Why it's important. So we're try and do it that way but uh, i think that for us we'll be um we're gonna that will be we'll look at changing that more and more i think to uh, as we get to more sites the the me as the message gets disseminated it gets weakened often so yeah it sounds like your your comment tim about you and tom and colin the whole tone that is a cultural thing isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's huge isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. that's, a, that's I remember like back in the, the early days, not long after I moved up to Manchester and joined CCM, I, I wrote a blog for the CCM website that was all about using spiritual gifts in a meeting. So prophecy, tongues, all of that stuff. I, I had some points and um, I tried to be a bit edgy and provocative. And I called it like 10 ways to kill a church with your gifts. <laughs> and um, Colin took me to task on it. I was like, you can't put that on, on the side of is that every point you've made, I, I agree with them, behind them, they're all right. Just change the title, just call it 10 ways to serve the church with your gifts. And every point, turn it from a negative to a positive. And 
that for me was the moment i'm like right i i get it i get the voice of this church i get what we're about and how we're communicating and um and that that story's just stuck with me and like every every communication now if it feels like we're going negative on something it just jars against me and um, needs rewording and it's yeah it's quite a big thing and i know other churches that that quite like that sort of edge and provocativeness and that's not to criticize it but it's it's not our way it's not the way we yeah. we do it and um yeah it's, uh, and, and some of that i think is you you know some of that you can if you're talking about a multi-site scenario and how you teach people to do that you can write some of that down on a piece of paper but some of that is just caught isn't it it's about people being with you for long enough to to learn that lesson maybe there is a moment where someone tells you tom like because you, yeah. you know we get something wrong yeah. but it is a kind of it's a feel it's a nuance and it's something that's caught and then you work it out week by week don't you so we have two moments every week with our site leaders our site leaders are, are brilliant at delivering the message and also within the kind of feel of our family yeah. but we we go over the messages twice each week tuesdays and thursdays we go this is what's going on on sunday and everyone knows but yeah, yeah there's this cultural thing which is definitely caught when it comes to delivery mm. and yeah 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 absolutely so um, yeah we've got um kind of admin staff in place who do a lot of the um setting up communication calendars and working out what things go out when but the actual writing of the the emails and stuff like that uh we still keep it as myself or sometimes tim or between us we we keep that just because we we've got the voice and yeah and we know it and yeah we we want to hold on to that um yeah cool um Another question just to open up then, which um, it kind of goes back to where we were at at the start a bit about um, who gets to make decisions and, um, uh, and stuff. Um, but just by way of example, let's, um, let's put a scenario. You've got someone in one of your congregations, one of your sites who has been um, with you for a while. So, you know, you, you trust them. They're a, a valued member of, uh, of the congregation, but maybe not like part of the site team particularly. And they have an idea for an event that they want to do. Um, within your setup, what would they do? Who would they go to? What would be then, um, if the idea was liked, where would it get escalated? What, what process would you go through with something like that for, for an event to go from the idea in someone's head to being an actual thing that you do? Um, Tim, do you want to kick off on this one? And then I was hoping you'd go Phil to go first, because I think... <laughs> We've struggled with this a few times recently, so All right. I wanted Phil to tell us what he did, and then yeah. I pretend that's what we yeah. were doing. Cool. <laughs> Phil, tell Tim what to do next time. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not sure that we're great at this either, to be honest. I think one of our, probably one of our strengths in our part, you know, has been that we've made a lot, we've been quite, to use the Rick Warren phrase, purpose-driven. So a lot of the initiative has come out of the centre, which has meant that we're very clear about what we're about, but I'm not sure we've been brilliant at being as permissive or creators is such a culture where people take initiative and i think that is one of the comments that we've had people say to us and i think it's there's some truth in it um but i think we're trying to get better on it um so i think typically if that happened now i think if someone in the congregation came up with an idea there would be all sorts of kind of immediate questions it would they would go to their site leader mm -hmm. and i think i hope our site leaders would you know if it involves a bunch of money and a you know a load of people then there's going to be more questions asked about it because obviously it's just that's a bigger deal or i think that i think the initiative needs to sit within our kind of mission and our culture so if they're doing something which is really out of step with the kind of thing, way we would do things then we're probably not going to say yes to it um you know and i can you know we have a certain approach in evangelism for example we tend to work friendship evangelism we use alpha all those kind of things and if someone wants to do something which is way out of that and make that a big deal we might go it's not really who we are it's not wrong it's not really who we are so somewhere probably in an unspoken way it will be sort of stress tested against our approach and our, how we do things around here um but if it fits and if it's not a big financial ask I'm hoping the site leaders would work it out and go, yeah, we'll make it work. Or they would come to me and I try to lead into saying yes rather than no as much as possible. Having said that, we have at times been too slow, which I think frustrates people. And at times I think also we've almost let things go too much in the other way. And then there's been a financial repercussion and that's not gone brilliantly either. So, um, so yeah, 
those kind of issues, the amount of people it involves, the amount of money it involves, the buildings it involves are questions we would want to ask. Does this fit within the kind of who we are? And if it, if it does, and those other factors are kind of fairly low level and there's not a big risk, then I'd want to lean in saying yes, and it would go to the site leader. And then if they felt unsure, they would come and speak to me. Yeah. Tim, how would you do it? <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Um, actually, I think um, because we are, we're a multi-site that's based on kind of church planting, really, um, then the, the need for initiative and the sort of person that you need to plant a church is they have to be pretty self-starting yeah. creative and you need a few people around them like that um and so that the, and actually one of our one of the cultures we talk about is a have a go culture uh, and we yeah. you know we preach on it we make quite a big deal of it um and so historically that is very much who we are if people come with ideas usually we say yes um almost straight away um my my because i've run the finances as well my, i do always think money but actually we're finding just because of the way our church is set up we don't have any of our own buildings um because all of our sites are relatively small most of the ideas that people have tend not to there isn't really a financial imperative really on them so we um so actually and we, but we've recently been realizing that our calendar is filling like just our yearly calendar i mean we've got um, and some of that is initiative from the centre. So we have a school of ministry, school of ministry, and a school of theology, um, which are really important to us. We have other site leader training. There's Alpha. There's um, community group Sundays. All of that. And actually, Sundays are filling up. Um, so Sundays, Saturdays, and evenings are filling lots. Uh, and we're now having other people come and say, "Look, there is this need in church. We'd really like to do this." And historically, we go, "Yeah, brilliant. Go for it." Um, but then you realise, "Oh, actually." finding you a gap in the calendar and then i'm not convinced i want people to go to something every single saturday um and then even and then the, sometimes the tone of the event isn't quite what we think so i think we're realizing actually i don't think we have to pull things back in um but we're realizing that we need uh, actually a pretty high level conversation that is uh, that sets the philosophical boundaries of you know this this is what initiative looks like in terms of the things that we start um so yeah somebody wanted to start something for people in the workplace they wanted to do like a something once a month and actually the idea was a good idea um but we just realized gosh actually that's they're going to want uh, they'll want publicity behind it yeah, um, yeah. They'll, they'll want people to go we also have lots of other things that are once a month so that means you could have someone going to three saturday mornings a month mm -hmm. for example um, so yeah so we need to think quite carefully um, so I think we haven't actually squared the circle yet I think this is um, we're, we're perhaps coming from a we've been very loose and I, I, all of us don't want to make things tighter and more controlled if you ask anybody in the, the central team we'd be like we want people to have a go and take lots of initiative um, but I'm realizing that actually just we're close to it being detrimental um, to who we are and what we do so um, so yeah, but I think we're at the beginning of trying to trying to work that out, really. So yeah, I think it's a little bit different as well. If um, like you were saying, someone wants publicity, someone wants the the church as an organisation to kind of own a thing, yeah. uh, it takes a lot of focus and vision onto it, which mm. comes away from other things. Like I remember um, a few weeks ago, Tim, you were saying about um, a couple of people who were asking to do like a, a 24 hour prayer thing uh, at the start of the lockdown. Mm. Uh, and this was just as we were trying to get everybody into online meetings, into online community groups. We had a lot that we were already trying to tell people to do. Um, and it wasn't a no, don't do a 24 hour prayer thing. I mean, we're not going to tell people not to pray, but right now this isn't what we can be leading out within the communication to people. So the kind of halfway house was, look, there's a few of you who've got some energy and some vision to be praying, get together and pray. Uh, we, we don't need on everything to, to carry it as a, as a church. Some, some things are good to just do. And yeah. 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 I think that's, I think that's right. I think sometimes it's, yeah. If you, as long as it doesn't require loads of money and, and you don't need to give you loads of publicity, <laughs> just go. I mean, it's interesting. You were saying Tim about just the kind of just, the, the calendar kind of getting kind of built up and too kind of potentially you know intense 
that's definitely one of the things that we've had to work through and just we've discovered having to try and build a rhythm into the life of the church which is really important when we do certain things when we don't do certain things when we run groups when we don't run groups and also we've tried to therefore go you can take that initiative and you want to do that every you know it's a difference between a one-off event and something you want to do regularly you can do that regularly but it needs to become a group and we'll advertise we'll put it into that box and if people want to get involved they can sign up and become part of your group and just building a rhythm around groups and allowing groups for us sometimes to be regular groups but sometimes to be groups around a particular kind of desire to meet a need has meant that's where that one can go and that's really helped us actually stopping it from becoming just too kind of crazy in terms of the church calendar and diary yeah, yeah very good um we're, we're almost out of time now we've got about five more minutes left of what we planned in um, i'm just going to ask you uh, just one more thing each and then we'll we'll wrap it up um we have a lot of people listening to these who haven't gone multi-site yet but are thinking about it and it's um uh, a possibility for them i'll just get you to share one one thing that if you've got someone listening who is about to go multi-site or is preparing their church to go that way what would be one bit of what one nugget of wisdom around management operations systems anything like that, that that you wish you knew when you got started um tim you may fill the first last time you can go first this time <laughs> <laughs> my word of wisdom is listen to phil that's, that's, <laughs> um, that's, that's a great question i just I, yeah, it, there are so many different things I could say. <clears throat> I think in a funny way, you have to be, uh, nobody, we haven't, this is, I don't know if this isn't really operations, but it does affect how you do operations in that it really is a process of giving away when you do multi-site and, um, and turning leadership into top-down leadership into sideways influence. Um, so it, we, I think our operations actually have, a quite a, a quite sideways influence um and that actually there is a there is a um kind of if you are the one of the senior leaders in that there is a, a i don't know what the right language is emotionally you have to deal with the fact that you're giving away a whole bunch of authority to yeah, other people right. and decision making and all of that um and so your sideways influences on the cultures or, or your constants um and so the uh, and actually, my word of wisdom would be it's much harder than you think it is. But if you give it time, it will work quite well for you. Very good. Uh, Phil, give us a word of wisdom. <laughs> well, my, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly concerned about even saying this because so this, this might sound a bit negative. Probably my word of wisdom would be think very carefully about doing it. Because I think it, it's a great model, potentially, but also it's, it's actually quite a, it's quite a dangerous model as well. And I. I think my concern, multi sites worked really well for us and it sounds like it's worked great for you, but it was very difficult and we did it partly because we ran out of space. In other words, we had momentum and we had people coming. What we were doing was already working, if that makes sense. And I would be really reticent. If I was leading a church and I was thinking about multi site, I would not go multi site unless where I was already running was working really well and we were growing. Because I think the danger is if you're not, you can divide into two sites and it implodes because you just multiplied the prop. You've lost all the good things, some of the good things you had. And now you've got, you know, you've diluted stuff. And, I, and that's, the, you know, that's not to say it can't work. I'm sure, I'm sure there's loads of scenarios which would prove me very wrong. But um, I think sometimes in church circles, things become trendy A multi-site can be one of those and i think it's a it, it's like tim said it's proper hard and it can be a problem it can be great but i would do it for the right reasons and be very honest about whether we are set up for this and we're healthy enough to do it probably great i hope that doesn't sound negative it's not no. meant to no that's, that's brilliant that's one of the big reasons why we're doing these like we mm. did a whole series of these looking at different areas of what's involved we want people to be well informed about what multi-site is, how it works, and, and able to make that choice well. So, yeah, definitely, definitely um, hear that advice. So we, we're going to wrap this one up there. We will be back on next month. So um, check the broadcastnetwork.org for all of our content and um, sign up for the mailing list and you will hear all about the next one when it is coming. And, yep, have a great week, everyone. See you later. <laughs>